talking with Kim Fraser. Before the break, you were sharing a little bit about um, being a barrister, mm. getting a divorce, and how that changed your world around. Mm. In your time as a barrister, what did you think of things like personal de development, spiritual growth? What was your... was there a thought? Mm. Not really, but if I did think about it at all, I just thought that it was pretty loopy mm. and uh, nothing to do with me at all. I didn't believe in any of the more esoteric spiritual things. I certainly didn't give any credence to clairvoyance or any of those sorts of things. So it really became a shock to me later when I became clairvoyant. <laughs> So <laughs> had to do a double think about that one. Yeah. Okay. So you moved. You went to a personal development yeah. workshop. What What happened then? Well, it was mainly about uh, the recognition that you create your own life, and uh, and that everything in it has something to do with you, or it would be happening to somebody else. And at the time, because I'd really grown up to be a good girl, mm -hmm. and I worked very hard at being good, mm -hmm. and so therefore, if there was a problem, really, it wasn't Saint Kim. It was the other person. And so I'd always, I guess, unconsciously put myself into a victim mentality if anything went wrong because I was such a good person that I couldn't have created that. Uh, so it was a real shock and pretty depressing at first to think that, whoa, I created all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and it took me a little while to get the hang of how to deal with that. But what I realised was that if I could screw things up so much, then I could fix them. Mm -hmm. And so it gave me the opportunity to start to get conscious about how I was creating uh, the events of my life and the interactions that I had with other people. And it helped me to bring to an end the chapter where I had allowed life to sort of happen to me a lot. And instead of that, I sort of happened to life a bit more now, you know, and uh, of course you still don't know what's around the corner, but if you have the tools to deal with it, you can stop something from becoming a big problem. You can have a little problem that you can sort of use as a growth platform, uh, but you don't have to create a train wreck. So, <laughs> <laughs> Or the, uh, the semi-trail at the end of the tunnel. That's it. You yeah. don't have to do that. Yeah. Okay. So take us through um, part of that personal journey mm. with your various teachers mm -hmm. to where you are and what you're doing okay. now. The first people that I trained with were Barbara and Terry Tebow, who run the LifeSpring organisation in Sydney. Mm -hmm. And they are very remarkable people, very loving, and they teach a lot of uh, tools that the ordinary person with no background in alternative spirituality can just use straight away. Very practical and very grounded. So that gave me a lot of mental and emotional tools to work with, and I found them very effective. For instance, um, that's where I learned about affirmations and visualizations which I'm sure the people who watch your program would already be familiar with but I wasn't until mm -hmm. then. Uh, after Barbara and Terry uh, I spent about five years with them. Uh, I then met Master Chokok Sui who was the founder of Pranic Healing, a Filipino man. He was a guru and a very very great soul. He's left his body now. Mm -hmm. uh, I studied with him for seven years and taught Pranic Healing. Pranic Healing is a no touch, uh, no drug energetic healing technique and um, I got so much out of that and and he was an, a remarkable man and he taught us about uh, comparative spirituality or comparative theology from a very high vibrational source you know himself mm -hmm. uh, and he he would just bring these teachings through really remarkable and uh, you know blessings from these gurus really changed my life and uh, in particular, I can remember one day in one of these pranic healing, pranic healing classes that there was one of the gurus from that organisation uh, led us in a meditation and gave us a blessing. And before that meditation, I had not been clairvoyant. I could not see chakras. After that meditation, from immediately afterwards, I could. And I couldn't turn it off. And for about a six-week period, I was seeing everybody's chakras, their energy centres, sort of wobbling out the front of their body and out the back of their body. And I've got to tell you, it was highly amusing, <laughs> but also a little bit frustrating and weird because mm. just walking down the street or in court, because I was still in wig and gown and running legal cases, okay. and I could see the judge's chakras, I could see my opponent's chakras, I could see what happened to their chakras when a pretty girl came into the room, <laughs> the sex chakra goes, chung! <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> the that would have been a <laughs> it was hilarious it was really hilarious and uh, so with pranic healing and, and that particular experience which taught me lots and lots about the chakras um, that was probably the next part about my journey okay I just want to jump back to the court for a second yeah so you're there with your wig on so you you can see what's actually going on yeah. with someone's chakras and, yeah. and truth or not well I could actually and what's coming out of their mouth yes what how did that change that because you know, with law, it's got to be based on the evidence. Of course, yeah. Did you have a case where... I had one particular case where I had a, a client uh, during this six-week period. Uh. And, um, <laughs> and anyway, they were in the witness box. And, uh, and it actually, it wasn't my client. It was someone else I was watching in the witness box. And uh, they answered a question, and a big <laughs> black flash came out of their throat chakra. And I just knew that they'd been lying about what they were talking wow. about. Yeah. So it was very handy. And I also had the same experience a couple of times with, um, with a person with whom I was negotiating to try and get an out-of-court settlement. And, and uh, I was told that this was the last offer. There wouldn't be any more money. Big black flash comes out <laughs> of the throat chakra. And I thought, uh-huh. <laughs> and of course, we ended up settling for a higher figure. So it was a very educational time. And, and, uh, and I think that uh, on, you could say that's taking unfair advantage, but at the same time, you can also say that every single person is actually aware on this level, but mm. not quite so consciously. Mm. You know when, or often you can know when someone's lying. You just know. Mm. And the reason you know is because your chakras, your energy field, is talking to their energy field. And, um, and you just find out things uh, through your intuition all the time. Mm. So during that six week period, I just had a very augmented experience of, uh, of knowing what was going on with other people. Mm. It was mm. also fascinating looking at uh, the chakra systems of different people in terms of uh, looking at, because we have seven major chakras mm -hmm. and each one of them is responsible for a different part of our life. And for instance, the crown chakra is about our divine relationship and being inspired and the base chakra at the base of the spine is largely about security and the sorts of things that come into security can be money and finance. Well when during this period I noticed that my colleagues who were very very successful in the profession and made a lot of money had massive base chakras you know that they were sort of wide and, and long and uh, those who weren't so successful may have been just as bright but they just couldn't anchor it mm -hmm. into a successful career and they had quite wobbly base chakras and I thought that's what I've been taught but I was seeing it you know yeah, okay yeah and then uh, also I noticed during that period that the people who meditated and prayed a lot tended to have very large crown chakras and uh, and those who weren't interested in the divine at all tended to have very small crown chakras and it made me realize that the chakras are really our centers of consciousness and that we see the world according to how developed the various chakras are mm -hmm. and we'll be interested in the things that resonate with our energy field. And, uh, and so to somebody to whom angels and the divine is real part of their life, that's because they've got the antenna, they've got the crown chakra through which they can pull in all that stimulus. But for a person who doesn't have that, to them that stuff just doesn't exist. Mm. Yeah, so. it's, it's all hooly ghouly yes. or yeah. left of Pluto. Yeah, that's okay. right. We'll take another break and come back and continue this conversation. It's getting more interesting. Stay with us. <laughs> 